This is the story of a pair of champions, a pair who form one of the most successful combinations in the history of automobile racing. Mark Donahue, a brilliant young engineer, does the driving, while Roger Penske, a retired driving great, manages the team from the sidelines. Theirs is the most competitive business in the world, with enormous challenges on and off the track. The vast background of racing knowledge this pair employs to meet these challenges gives them a unique advantage, an advantage so potent that one might describe it as four hands on the wheel. The 1969-24 Hours of Daytona, a race for the world's fastest prototypes and sports cars, a classic battleground for the Penske Donahue racing team. Mark Donahue at the wheel of a Lola Chevrolet, decked out in the vivid blue colors of the Penske stable, challenges for the lead in the opening laps, while the boss, Roger Penske, controls the strategy from the pits. A race lasting 24 hours takes more than raw speed to win, and it is Penske's job to establish a pace for his driver that will keep him in contention without breaking the car and to direct the car's periodic pit stops for gasoline and tires. Sharing the wheel of the Lola with veteran driver Chuck Parsons, Donahue keeps the car in contention with the favored German Porsche team until a series of minor mechanical ailments begin to slow its pace. As night falls over the vast Daytona International Speedway, the Penske Donahue entry seems to be floundering. It is their first outing with the Lola, a car with a poor record in endurance racing, and the debut appears doomed to failure. The end appears to come in the dead of night when the Lola rolls to a stop with a cracked exhaust manifold. More than an hour and 15 minutes is consumed making the repair. Before the sun rises again, another half hour will be lost in the pits. But Penske and Donahue are not the only ones to have encountered trouble. And by mid-morning, the last of the leading Porsches retires. This gives them first place, and they roll on to a fantastic comeback victory. Some will call their win lucky. But to Roger Penske, there is little room allotted to luck in his racing business. I haven't really uh, beat the bandwagon every Monday morning that my cars have won the races. I felt that uh, I want to be known as a businessman and a businessman in racing. He can ask the, the impossible sometimes, and we can explain why it is impossible, but a lot of times, uh, what he does ask, you know, is, is a pretty good idea after all. You can't be competitive and you can't win unless you have the best car. But you don't do it by just saying you're going to do it. You do it by, you know, a lot of hard work. And the trouble is you work hard for a long period of time and you don't really know whether you're going to make it or not until the first race. And after that, it's too late. I found out that coming in second and coming in third is not what your sponsors want. I learned this a long time ago. Uh, uh, from a fellow that said, Roger, I'm not interested in the excuses why you didn't win. I want to know how we can win the next one, and this is really what we work by. And I think we get a lot done for the amount of money we have invested and for the amount of, of uh, people that we have working here. I think racing is a business. I feel it's probably one of the greatest uh, things to use as far as taking a product and showing what can be done with it and then bring it back into regular life to be sold over the counter. Roger really runs the team. I don't run it. He, you know, calls the, the overall shots. 1968 was a milestone year for Roger Penske and Mark Donahue. They entered 28 major races and won 16. With their victories came championships in two of North America's most important racing series. The Trans-American Sedan title went to the Penske Donahue Camaro with incredible ease. In 13 races, Donahue won 10 times 
despite fierce competition from cars sponsored by Ford and American Motors. The team's first Trans Am triumph came in the Sebring 12-hour endurance race, where Donahue teamed with Canadian Craig Fisher. Exotic sports cars usually dominate Sebring, but the pair quickly challenged the leaders with their boxy blue sedan. In what has become a trademark of the Penske Donahue racing style, Sebring was the scene of perfectly organized pit work, a time-saving device that helped them to win a class victory and third overall in the standings, the highest finish for an American-built sedan in the 18-year history of the race. Rapid pit work gave them an edge at other tracks, too. Here, at Bridgehampton, New York, gasoline is added, and Donahue was sent on his way, barely before the Camaro's wheels have stopped turning. But if they were quick in the pits, they were quicker on the track. At the Mid-Ohio Trans Am, for example, Donahue arrived late and was forced to start at the back of the field. But within 10 laps, he had taken the lead from a pack of determined Mustang and Javelin drivers. And at the finish, he had a full lap lead on his nearest competitor, an effort typical of the giant edge Penske and Donahue enjoyed for most of the season. When he wasn't campaigning his Trans Am Camaro, Donahue could be found belted behind the wheel of Penske's brutally powerful McLaren Chevy sports racing car, a low-slung 600 horsepower Group 7 machine that is one of the fastest racing vehicles in the world. The Penske Donahue McLaren dominated the nine-race United States Road Racing Championship despite stubborn opposition. After mechanical trouble sidelined them in the opening event, Donahue bounced back to win the next two races. Despite another pair of wins at mid-season, rivals Skip Scott and Chuck Parsons kept the championship in doubt until the final race of the series at Mid-Ohio. There, Mark led from start to finish to win his fifth event of the series and the title. With a pair of championships sewed up, Penske and Donahue set out to beat the finest road racing drivers in the world in the rugged six-race struggle for the Canadian-American Challenge Cup. The series opened under rainy skies at Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, with the orange McLarens of Dennis Holm and Bruce McLaren leading the pack. Donahue spun on the opening lap and spent the remainder of the race trying to regain lost ground. To finish, he had struggled back to third place to stay in the title race. The weather was clear at Bridgehampton, Long Island, and Donahue was at the top of his game. After engaging in a long duel with Holm, McLaren, and the winged chaparral of Jim Hall, Mark outlasted his rivals and drove to a convincing victory. Third place at Edmonton, Alberta, and second at Riverside, placed the team in an excellent position to win the championship in the final race of the series at Las Vegas, Nevada. But it was not to be. At the last agonizing moment, their engine refused to start, and they were forced to settle for a third place in the final standings, a finish that prompted Donahue to lament. We uh, came and we saw and we lost. <laughs> Despite their Can-Am disappointment, 1968 brought extraordinary success. In addition to their victories, they proved to the racing world that wherever they chose to race, they possessed the power to win. And in racing, there is no other measure of excellence. Down deep, Roger Penske is still a champion race driver. But today, his high-speed driving is restricted to occasional practice outings in one of his race cars. At age 32, he is in his fifth year of retirement from competition and operates a Philadelphia business network that includes a large Chevrolet dealership in addition to his racing team. But Penske still recalls the middle 1950s when racing was just a weekend hobby. Yesterday, all right. How are you feeling, Frank, all right? My uh, commitment in racing probably started when I ran a field trial back in 1957, 56 or 57, with a XK120. 
I was pitted against uh, 30 or 40 or 50 competitors. We ran on a, out through a field and in through a woods, actually, with the cars. And we had three, three runs. And uh, after the first run, I was about seventh or eighth. Uh, I didn't know the course very well, and I went back out and walked around and looked at it. And then my second run, I think I was in second spot. And on the third run, I really tried to see if I could win this particular event, and I did. And at that point, I realized that uh, taking all things into consideration with a good car, we were able to, I was able to win. While still an undergraduate at Lehigh University, Penske began racing production sports cars and amateur road races. He was a winner practically from the start and quickly sought out faster, more challenging brands of sports car competition. I purchased Bob Holbert's Porsche RS from him to campaign the following season. But I ran the uh, Porsche and then was uh, able to get into an RSK and then go to Sebring with Bob. This is kind of the, the way we started out. In 1961, Penske teamed with veteran Bob Holbert at Sebring. Driving a Porsche, the pair finished sixth and won the Index of Performance trophy. This boosted Penske into big time sports car racing, where he polished his skill in Porsches, Maseratis, and Coopers, and learned some of the realities of the racing business. I remember when I was first started, when I was racing in college, uh, at the tenth of the month, my wife and I didn't have any money to buy any more food, and I had to go out and start working, and that's about what you do in racing. As your racing program increases and escalates, you have to get in with bigger sponsors and, and spend more time and, and get more involved. Uh, we've been very lucky uh, over the past years. Uh, my first sponsor, real sponsor, was DuPont. It was in 1962 when Penske shook the racing establishment to its roots. Taking a wrecked single-seat Grand Prix racer, Penske converted it into a tiny, lightweight sports car and used it to dominate the Times Grand Prix at Riverside, beating a host of international stars in the process. We got the car there. It never turned a wheel, and the fastest time, I think, was 135.6. And I went out and was warming it up at about 136, and people couldn't quite realize, you know, what was happening. And before he knew it, in a matter of nine or ten laps, I had broken the qualification mark set by Bruce or Dan at that particular point went on to sit on the pole and I, I ran a very easy race again trying to finish and it was a great thrill of course uh, we won the national championship with it the next year then it was sold to Bruce McLaren and he put an Oldsmobile engine in it and you know dusted not only uh, the foreign competition but Blue Hall and myself off with the Chaparrales with the same cars in 1964 Penske joined with Texas designer driver Jim Hall to campaign the now legendary Chaparral sports racing cars. At the time, the most successful automobiles of their type in the world. In addition to compiling an excellent record for the Texas team, Penske used his time in the Chaparrales to gain valuable insight about the workings of a major racing operation, experience that would prove invaluable in the years to come. Well, this was a... Uh great thing for me because I learned quite a bit about vehicle dynamics and some of the inner workings of a good racing uh, operation. And of course, uh, Jim was capable at that point of probably producing the best racing car, which we can call the unfair advantage. And I felt that uh, if I'm going to play, I might as well play on the good team. During this period, Penske began to drive Chevrolet products almost exclusively, splitting his time between the Chaparral Chevys and the lightweight Grand Sport Corvettes, which he drove at Sebring and in the Road America 500 at Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. But it was to be with the Chaparral that Penske would score his final high grades as a racing driver. And I got my opportunity. Of course, he hurt himself at most sport, and I drove in the Chaparral at Riverside and Monterey in uh, 64, and then again at NASA, and had the best car and the number one car. I think this was uh, uh, very good for my uh, uh, career, and also I learned quite a bit working with Hall. Uh, no one knew that I was going to make a transition from the general managership of this Chevrolet dealership at that time, which was McKean, and try to purchase it uh, in February. But I had certain business commitments, which I felt in the long run would be better for me than continue to race. 
so i had said that nasa would be the last set of races i was fortunate to do well in the corvette of course i tried very hard then the following weekend running with the chaparral we won the governor's cup uh, race on saturday i believe and then the big race on sunday where's uh, where's tom you know is he in the office huh all right hi right, billy how you doing, all right? Fine. Roger hey, Penske quit racing at age 29, probably without having reached the peak of his driving talents. But he has remained true to his retirement pledge, and since has moved to prominence in the business world. His involvement with his automobile dealership and his car rental franchise consumes a great deal of his time, much of it in overseeing the smallest details with his employees. His racing tire distributorship dovetails perfectly with his racing team. And it is within this realm, the realm of automotive competition, where his interest is keenest. How does that compare with what we did uh, last year? Remember what our total figure was last year? Do you have Three that? times. Three times, that's good. Okay. All right, thanks. Mark. He doesn't have to pick that engine up now because he's going to have to go back down this afternoon to pick up that uh, tail section that's coming in from uh, Lola. One of the, the greatest things and the feelings I have is when my race cars are turned out at the racetrack. When that car comes out and it, it's spotless and it stays spotless and we don't have oil leaks, it, it, this is really gives me satisfaction that we've really done a good job. It's like an architect that makes a drawing and when the house is done, uh, and it comes up to his expectation. This is this is the fellow that's really satisfied. When you're satisfied with what you're doing, you know you can do it even better. Well, my first race was in 1960 in an Elva Courier at uh, Lime Rock, I believe. I had uh, become interested in racing oh, about three or four years before, but I was in college, and I uh, that was my first effort and. After I got out of college, uh, I'd been working for about a year and decided to uh, take uh, a chance at racing just for kicks. So I bought an Elva Courier and a uh, Chevrolet station wagon. I traded my streetcar in for those two and went to Marlboro, got my license in one weekend and uh, drove the Elva right up to uh, Lime Rock, came in fourth. After I won the championship in 1961 with Elva. I was asked to join the Road Racing Drivers Club. Mark Donahue's early years in racing followed a familiar pattern for many East Coast amateurs. Weekend races and a variety of cars while holding a regular job. Working as an engineer, he was constantly strapped for money to maintain his racing machinery and dreamed of driving for one of the major teams. His chance came through the friendship of Walter Hanskin, one of the finest competition drivers America has ever produced. And Walter was president of the club, and he lived in uh, Bedminster. And Bedminster is about 20 minutes west of Summit, where I lived. So he said he would always pick me up on the way in and take me in there, and we became very good friends, uh, just riding into New York every first Tuesday of the month. And um, he... Uh, tried to put in a good word for me with Meekum, but Meekum was always interested in using big name drivers and, you know, they had big money, so why shouldn't they use, you know, they put so much money into it, why take an unknown? You know, we probably wouldn't do it either. And um, so he would always take big name drivers, but Walter did convince him to let me drive uh, a Ferrari with them at Sebring in 1965, I think it was. Donahue teamed with Hanskin for the first time in the 1965 Sebring race, where they nursed a John Meekham entered Ferrari home, despite the fact that its clutch failed early in the going. Donahue drove well in his first crack at the big time, and it brought him another ride with Hanskin, this time in a Lola Xerox special at Elkhart Lake. Hanskin was endowed with a unique ability to teach. And Donahue was a brilliant student, so brilliant that Hanskin convinced a reluctant John Holman to give him a place on the Ford factory team in the 1966 Daytona Continental. So with all that behind, we arrived down there, and uh, 
Walter introduces me to John, and uh, John said, he said, have you ever driven at 200 miles an hour? And I said, no. And he said, have you ever driven on the high banks of Daytona? And I said, no. And he said, turned to Walter, and he said, well, he said, we better find somebody else. <laughs> and he, I felt about an inch high. But um, Walter talked him into letting me try it out in practice. You could see the mechanics in their eyes, you know, that they did, they were doing all this work, and then some amateur uh, uh, driver was going to come down and, you know, probably either not go very fast or destroy all their efforts. The Ford team's fears were unfounded. Mark drove nearly as well as his teacher, and they kept their powerful Mark II Ford among the leaders until mechanical troubles dropped them to third place in the final standing. His efforts at Daytona brought him another Ford ride with Hanskin at Sebring a month later. Again, the pair drove beautifully, finishing a solid third. Shortly thereafter, Mark was assigned to the Ford Le Mans team with Hanskin, but it was not to be. Death was to cruelly destroy this unique friendship on a rain-swept curve at Le Mans, France. A few weeks following Sebring, the great Walter Hanskin crashed while testing his Ford Mark II and died a few days later. No one in the world of racing was saddened more than his young protege. I had relied on the guy quite a bit to, to um, give me a lot of guidance as to what to do and what not to do and you know how to conduct myself on and off the racetrack and I had you know pretty much come to respect his opinion and, and, and everything I'd done that he'd said to do had turned out right so uh, I was kind of like, uh, you know, a 10-year-old kid that was just, you know, whose father was killed. He was, he was really like a dad to me in racing. It, it, was, uh, it was real difficult. Donahue continued to race despite the loss of his friend. As the 1966 United States Road Racing Championship Series was getting underway, the recently retired Roger Penske was seeking a driver for his new Lola Chevrolet, sponsored by Sunoco and carrying the bright blue and yellow colors of that company. He contacted Donahue and engaged him on a temporary basis for the first race on the schedule. I, want it yet. I haven't been out there long enough to really try to get it down right. Well, we got you 162, which is this. With the traffic up here? We got you right in front of us at 162. Now, of course, they're gonna, you had to slow down there because of the yellow. So I was just going to go for that one race, and after that race, and we'd decide what we'd do next. And so we went to that race and took a big zero you know we lost the i went off the road in the rain and you know wiped out the oil cooler and lost the oil and blew the motor and i thought when i came in and the motor was banging i figured well that's the end of that i you know will never be asked to drive again i was really upset about it because i figured this was my one good good chance and you know i blew it but he asked me to drive again we went to that was saint javit we went to mossport and the engine took a big zero there and uh so i figured you know now i'm surely out and uh, then he asked me, he said, well, we'll put a little 333 in it. That's when we had that iron 427. He said, we'll put a little 333 and we'll go to Watkins Glen. So we went to Watkins Glen and burned the car to the ground. then that Sunoco was going to pull out and we would be history but he said he'd get another car and we went to Kenton one that was probably the biggest thrill I ever had in racing was after those three zeros to go out and that was the first professional race I ever won too and I we went out there and won that thing and then I called Roger on the phone and he said geez said, said I thought you were you called a little early he says I thought you were going to tell me you'd wiped out another one <laughs> Sebring, Florida, several weeks before the 1969 12-hour race. Donahue shakes down the Daytona winning Lola Coupe during a special practice session while the boss keeps track of things at an improvised pit area 
in a remote corner of the giant track. 49, uh, 49.8. We're gonna do it. He's coming in one lap. Okay. I'm gonna stop him right here then for the. These are the. These are those reins. These, yeah. Those are. That's well, good to know that those yeah. things work like that. You know, well, you can run them a while. Yeah. Did we have any skid on them when he went out? Brand new. Well, they'd run yesterday. Those aren't, those aren't, uh, those are wet tires you got in there now. Yeah, no. The intermediates. Yeah. Those ones he's running. Yeah, the intermediates, yeah. I don't know what tires he's running. Oh, well, I intermediate, I call yeah. them reins, yeah, there. Oh, we'll stop them right in here, then. Good. Move that hay bale a little bit, then you can... There you go, Ronnie, 40, 47, five. Stop him, Roy, you get up there so they can get him on us. Yeah, he's gonna come in now. Forty-seven, four. That was. What's the? What is the? I don't remember what good times are. The, last year, Sipper, they qualified forty-nine something. They're not. The Porsche aren't running any quicker than you are. You got the. You don't have good tires on either. Is, is that the only place there's water? Testing is often a lonely, grueling business. There are no cheering crowds and not a dime in prize money. But like the traveling salesman, racers must know the territory. And this means hours of experimentation with tires, gear ratios, suspension settings, carburation, and a hundred other variables that mean the difference between winning and losing. Donahue and his co-driver, Californian Ronnie Bucknam, have come to Sebring with Penske to test the Lola, and if possible, to record faster practice laps than their main rivals, the fabulous German Porsche team, which is also on hand for the test session. Between each run, the car is returned to its garage, where a series of adjustments, supervised by Donahue, are made by the crew. We ran out and we put five gallons in after we ran out, you see? Mm -hmm. Good to know that that thing uh, seems to work pretty good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's in, Marley. Come in. You know, both, so don't play forward. Now, don't worry about putting that on yet. Just, just, let's just tighten up the bottom thing. Then we'll get the other one in the right position. i got to pull it back to see how far I can hold it back this way. Right. You leave that separate and then come off the top here. Yeah, oh, all right. You've got an angle washer on it. So I mean, just a chamfer or just a... Yeah, good. I said Ronnie should build a... Coming off of here, make aluminum transition piece that has a gink in it like this once you get to the and then then put the hose on back over here huh what do you think about that well then you won't have the interference he can look he can that's come that's fine i don't think the, i don't know if the aluminum would live there 
Yeah. Let's put the tail on, huh? What'd you do now? We stiffen up the rear shocks, put a smaller plate on, put new brakes on. I'm gonna let you run nine laps. You don't wanna run too much on the brakes. You know, I would say we, you know, shifted 60. Forty-one, forty-five. Keep you guys honest on the other side. Yeah, good. Don't drop them. That means they must have got it out over there in the pits too. Hey, you were right about those tires. <laughs> yeah. How, hey, how about that engine? That's just a old Camaro engine. Don't get the temperatures. 41.4. Those bad. Germans jumping in their cars over there. <laughs> they're all up against the rail. <laughs> yeah, we figured they're all over there getting your time. Uh, you know, it's funny. It revs good. Um, in the lower gears, but in the fourth and fifth, it's, it just won't rev. Which was because we got the. Maybe that's, huh? Maybe that's not doing us any good. You know, well, the only way we're going to know, the only way we're going to know is when we come back down here and we're going to have Ronnie build everything up for the other one. We're not going to put it on, then we're going to try right. both tails. Yeah. It's the only way you're going to know. I don't well, think I it's. I want to do it here, have it removable, but you know, you just can't build anything and have it on the station there. You have to find out. Well, I'd like to, I guess, take it over there and look at it. And then let him go out and run it a while, and then let's call it a day. Mark Donahue is probably one of the most talented men in racing today. Uh, he's proven on the racetrack what he can do is in driving. Uh, won more races in the last two or three years than any other driver in the world. He also has a capability in the development area as far as testing. I like being a driver. I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't like it quite a bit. You have to, you know, to, to spend the time and the energy that's required. But right. on the other hand, um, it, it's tremendously taxing because your job really goes up on the line every time you get behind the wheel. And the minute there's somebody else, that, you know, that, that, that a guy can hire that, that's quicker, why the, the guy would be foolish not to hire him if he could. And uh, uh, so every time you, you know, you go to work, basically, you know, you, your job is, is, you know, being evaluated. And that doesn't happen in everyday life. You know, usually a guy, you know, is pretty much left on his own. To, you know, his own abilities will eventually pull him out. But, uh, uh, you know, having to face this every time you go is, is a little excruciating, you know, as far as your mental approach is concerned. Some people, it doesn't bother them. I think people like Mario Andretti and and uh, Bobby Unser, perhaps, and Al Unser, maybe, and, you know, some of those fellows who have been in racing for a long time and who are uh, accepted experts and who can drive almost anything and uh, uh, who uh, really don't know anything else uh, except driving hard, they can uh, pretty much not worry about this sort of thing. But in my position, uh, I don't think I'm as good a driver as I, as I am capable of of maybe getting the best car together. And uh, so, Penske Racing.
Fewer race teams are more tightly organized or more closely knit than the Penske organization. Composed of skilled machinists and mechanics operating in a spotless, well-equipped shop in suburban Philadelphia, they form the heart and muscle of the team. Crews are the hardest people to get because it takes tremendous dedication and a whole lot of hard work and a lot of long hours. We have two people with us, Carl Kainhofer and Roy Gain, who have been with Roger for years. And the other people that we have, we've acquired uh, more by them coming to us than us going to them. Uh, they hear about our team. They come to, you know, to look and ask if they could go to work. And we've kind of sorted out the, the good ones from the bad ones. But we've tried to keep our people more or less East Coast oriented and keep them kind of close-knit and working as a team. And this is, this is very hard to do. It really is. The race shop, I usually spend my time there in the evenings on my way home and then on the weekends. I'm in constant contact with Mark and Chuck Cantwell at the shop. This way, if there is a problem, I could go out. But these fellows are capable, and I think in order to be successful, you've got to give people responsibility. And when you do, they either produce or they don't, and you find out pretty quick what you have. I don't get a dime for working down here during the week. The only thing I make is, you know, what I make racing. But the more effort I put in down here, the better race car we get, and the more successful we might be racing. I think uh, the fellows realize, you know, that I'm trying as hard as they are, uh, all the time, and, and I'm, I try to do that to motivate them to try hard. Uh, it's one thing to get out and say, you guys work hard. It's another thing to get out and, and work hard and show them that you're working hard so that they work hard. And this, this is, I think, the key to motivation. I think in, in almost any business, the, the, uh, the key to success is, the, is if the boss works hard, everybody else does. And down the dealership, everybody works hard because there's nobody that can work harder than Roger. And I would... I don't think I could work harder than Roger, but I, I am trying, and uh, uh, I hope this is tending to set an example. With good cars, good sponsors, and good drivers, if we just do things we know we've done in the past and don't try to get too far out with new innovations, you know, all at once, we should, our percentage should be, I think, uh, on the winning side. Everybody in the world knows who Roger Penske is, and when Roger asks somebody to do something, whether it's, it's the guy uh, who runs the forklift truck at the airport, or the fellow who uh, um, uh, is the president of Goodyear Tire and Rubber, they, they all listen to him because he's Roger Penske and he's, he's proven himself to be uh, somebody to be reckoned with in any kind of endeavor, whether it's racing or business or sports or whatever. And uh, uh, this is a tremendous advantage, number one. And, and number two, uh, Roger's raced himself for quite a number of years and he knows what it takes. And he realizes that, that uh, you know, the big thing everybody in racing strives for is an unfair advantage. Something in their car or driver or a combination or a crew that nobody else can get. And uh, he will strive, you know, in, uh, just incessantly to try to get an unfair advantage. And Mark sets up his own cars. Uh, prior to going to a race, Mark will spend five, six, seven, eight hours on the surface plate with each one of our cars to get the suspension exactly the way he wants it. And he knows when the car gets there that it's set up the way he wants it, he knows what it has, and then he can go from there. So we work really as a pretty good team, uh, uh, not only from the driving, but in coordinating our complete racing program. Without him, I think that uh, we'd never gotten this far. Turns out that no matter how emotionally hopped up you get in racing, it isn't going to make you go any faster. The only way you're going to go faster is if you have a better car. And the only way you're going to get a better car you know, is to think about it a little bit and plan ahead and, and try to develop a better car. And, so the emotional end, uh, the old stab it and stare it technique, uh, is slowly dying away. I don't think you can make up for a bad car now by just standing on the gas real hard. You have to have a good car to start with. Race day at Sebring, with the fastest field in the race's long history, crouched in readiness. As the start nears, Penske runs through the team's race strategy with Donahue and his co-driver Ronnie Bucknam. The last bolt has been tightened on the Lola. Now it is up to Donahue and Buckham to drive it to victory against a field of powerful opponents. Donahue has been assigned to drive the opening stint of the race, and he knows that in order to lead, he must beat the new Italian Ferrari of Eamon and Andretti, a car that has run fractionally faster in practice. The start at Sebring is patterned after the one at Le Mans, France, where the drivers sprint for their cars from the opposite side of the track. Donahue nearly jumps the gun, then charges away as the green flag drops. 
Once inside the Lola, he scrambles into his safety harness, flicks the ignition switch, and powers away into the frantic first lap traffic jam. The Ferrari is slow to start and leaves the pits well behind the leading Porsches and Donahue, who is in excellent position to charge for the lead. But Sebring is 12 hours long, and it is not the Penske Donahue style of racing to rocket around for a few spectacular laps and then retire with a broken car. They will first establish a pace, fast enough to maintain pressure on the leaders, but still easy enough to save the automobile, and then methodically move up as the race progresses. While the boss keeps track of the competition, Donahue hurries onward across the flat central Florida landscape. Before two hours have elapsed, Donahue and Buckman have taken the lead. With the Porsches and the Ferrari hard on their heels, they hold first for 10 laps, then lose it when they make a routine pit stop. But once on the track again, this time with Bucknam at the wheel, it takes them only 18 more circuits to regain first. The car seems to be operating perfectly, and it appears that the team is on its way to a repeat of their astounding Daytona 24-hour victory. Again, it is more than rapid driving that is keeping the Lola out front. The team's patented high-speed pit work is helping too. A major pit stop is coming up, a stop in which a complete tire change will be made, fuel will be added, and the pads of the car's four disc brakes will be replaced. As the signal is passed to Bucknam to come in, Penske organizes his forces, making absolutely sure that each man knows his assignment. Buckman brings the car to a halt, and the crew leaps toward it in a furious ballet of motion. To the untrained eye, it looks like total confusion, but it is in fact as perfectly choreographed as a Broadway musical number, with Penske leading the routine. Changing the red-hot brakes is a difficult operation, an operation that takes some top flight teams as long as eight minutes to complete. The Penske crew gets the job done, plus the tire change in the refueling, in two minutes and 48 seconds. Donahue has replaced Buckman behind the wheel and has been informed that the Lola is handling strangely. Out on the track, Mark notices the problem immediately. Something appears to have broken in the rear suspension and he heads for the pits after only one lap. The Lola is gravely wounded. A major component in the complicated rear suspension has fractured. Hours would be consumed in making a replacement. Reluctantly, Penske withdraws the car from the race after three and a half hours. Dreams of winning two major international endurance races in a row are shattered. But their turn of bad luck is not ended. Shortly after the race, the Lola and its transporter are stolen, and over $30,000 worth of engines, tools, and spare parts are lost. The theft will force the team to scratch its plans to compete in the 24 hours of Le Mans race in France a few months hence. Sebring was an unfortunate race for the team but Penske and Donahue waste no time brooding over it. Ahead of them lie a multitude of racing efforts, including an expanded program in Indianapolis-type cars. Donahue will also be driving toward his second straight championship in the Trans-American Sedan Series in the face of increasingly strong opposition. The expanded Canadian-American Challenge Cup Series will surely include a new deep blue Penske car with Donahue at the helm and they'll try again at Sebring. Their commitment is complete. This is their sport, and both men are in it to stay.
I've been in racing since 1956 or 57 when I fooled around with my own cars and I'm still in it uh, 10 years. Uh, I expect to be in it as long as I have an interest. You don't um, uh, find too many 65-year-old race drivers announcing their retirement. And sooner or later you have to you know, think about something else to do. And the longer you stay in racing, the harder, to, as a driver, the harder it is to find something else to do. Mark Donahue will continue to drive for me as long as he wants to. However, I think he is smart enough, I am smart enough, we feel that at some point he's not fast enough, or his ability in other areas would be more helpful to us, I'm sure he will stop racing of his own accord. I'm giving him an opportunity to invest in our Chevrolet dealership here. I want him on our management team. He's just a solid race driver. I think we proved that when we went to the Rex Maze when he was on Dan Gurney's uh, tail for 100 miles. You give Mark the time to study the problem uh, and, and familiarize himself with the vehicle and also the speedway. I don't think there'll be anyone that can run as consistently as he can today, and he is still getting better. Not only does Mark get better, but the team improves with each race. Racing is more than a sport to Roger Penske and Mark Donahue. It is a way of life that is measured only in terms of victory. They seem to have found that rare ingredient of teamwork that gives them, for all intents and purposes, four hands on the wheel.